Hey, um, how you doing? So, uh, welcome back to my channel, and today I was gonna just try to make a quick video of walking through the process of how I make a, a bellows um, printing plate uh, for my bellows papers. And um, I don't know the quote-unquote right way to do this, um, so I just kind of do it the way I do it, and just it works for me, and it, and it produces good results. So the first thing we have here is the model of the plate that I'm... Um, I'm going to try to produce, and I um, I already have the model here. I didn't show you how I drew the model, uh, but here it is. This is the the plate design that I'm going to be making, and basically all I have to do is um, well I've already uh, drawn up the tool paths here. So I have a sixteenth inch end mill come in and clean up the um, do like the rough roughing out and you can see how rough it is and turn that off so it's pretty rough um, after the 16th inch end mill but it just tries to get as much material out as it can and then it comes in with a 32nd inch end mill and it gets a little cleaner um, but it's still not quite there uh, and hopefully that 32nd inch end mill um, won't break uh, it's obviously a very fragile little end mill but if you look at the this is the adaptive clearing strategy which is really nice on fusion especially that they let you use those strategies even with a um, um, even with a, a hobbyist license. Um, I mean, I just can't say enough good things about Fusion. It really is an incredible piece of software that we're lucky to have. And um, this optimal load here, I always set to 10% of the diameter of the end mill. So that's a pretty shallow optimal load. So hopefully we can keep that end mill from breaking. <laughs> and the feed uh, oh, that's actually quite the thing. I looked at this because uh, we got to make some changes. Flood coolant and then um, the feed per tooth, I think, should probably be half that for sure. Five, five thou or five tenths per tooth um, is probably okay. This is a this is a four flute, uh, thirty second inch end mill. I don't know how they grind four flutes on that tiny little thing, but they do it. Um, <coughs> so I think yeah, five ten thousands per tooth. Um, yeah, if you get under that, it starts to get into rubbing territory, which is not good. And that there, then there's there's run out issues with the spindle because I have a Tormach and it's like it's pretty good, but it's not like a fifty thousand dollar machine where there's like zero spindle run out. So I don't know. Maybe you want to keep it lower than that. Maybe. Well, I think twenty will be okay. Um, and then yeah, and then that's all good. The optimal load here is important. Um, Okay, and then we'll look at that tool path, and um, it just goes into these corners here, like, just cleans up the last bits of it. And then I do this one. Maybe I should look at the feeds and speeds on all of these, I think. Like, that's good. Yeah, okay, great. And then this one. Uh, and then I come in with a chamfer mill and just clean up just the, the last little bits, and hopefully that will get us, you know, like these really tight spots. Um, it cleans up like that, and the corners of the crosses and stuff, so hopefully we can get... Now obviously, I mean, the, the right way to do this, the traditional way to do it, would be with like, um, oh, like, you know, some sort of etchant, where you make a, where you make a mask, and then you put an etchant on there and it eats away, but I don't really know how to do any of that stuff, and so I kind of just go... I kind of just approach things with the tools that I have available to me um, here on a limited basis um, because I don't know how much someone would charge me to print a plate like this, but I know that I can do it myself in a couple of hours and uh, get a pretty, a pretty, a result that kind of approaches uh, professional. <laughs> so like something that looks good anyway from a couple feet away. Um, no, I, I, it, it does a good job. So we're going to go ahead and uh, one of the important aspects of my um, design is that the... Uh, the bellows, the the, bell, the plate, the size of the um, perimeter of the plate uh, matches the shape of the bellows paper itself. So if you see this orange construction line here that goes all the way around, that's the shape that my uh, bellows paper will be cut out of the steel rule die that I use to cut them out uniformly. Um, and so it's important that the, the perimeter of the plate matches the um, the external dimensions of the paper itself so that I can locate them together so I can exactly center the uh, print on the paper. Um, so that's the first step is to square the, up this piece of stock um, 
to the exact dimensions of the of this plate here, which is we look at this. The length is two and five seventy one, and the width is eight fourteen. So this is one inch thick, and this is like maybe two point six inches. So I already squared up one side. So we've got to go ahead and square up the other side and cut it to the right length, and then cut this to the right width. Now this is a three sixty brass, which is a leaded engraver's brass, um, and it's pretty critical that you use the leaded brass because uh, brass is very difficult. It's not very difficult, but it's not easily machined, not nearly as easily machined uh, if you don't get the leaded variety. Um, and the leaded variety is available in fewer sizes and shapes and stuff, but and it's more expensive. But you can get it still, um, and it's really good for making stuff like printing plates and stuff. And as long as you don't eat it, uh, the lead is not a big deal. It's like two percent of this is lead. It's not a big deal. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so. Uh, anyway, so we're going to square up the stock, and then we're just going to cut the design into it, hopefully, and then, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Cool. Cheers. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right, so I've got some, um, you know, uh, all three axes of the plate uh, <coughs> mount, uh, touched off in the, and um, I've got it mounted. So when I got this Tormach, um, I decided to go for the um, the Saunders Machine Works, uh, who make great videos on YouTube. They're really a cool channel. Um, makes this plate and uh, makes this special sort of modular vice system, um, and. I, when I saw that, I knew that uh, that's what I—that's the route I wanted to go, and I didn't even bother getting a, um, uh, you know, a CNC vise. Like a, they sell like a four-inch vise or whatever that mounts to the table underneath. But um, I, I just knew that this modular system made so much more sense. It's low, it's lower profile than the even with the plate, it's lower profile I think than the vise, and you can it just it makes so much sense. Um, it's a little, uh, um, what would you say? Uh, it takes a little bit longer, right, because you have to move it around and stuff, so the setups, maybe it adds a little bit of time to the setups, but uh, it does a great, I mean, I just think it's a lovely system, and I've never had a, you know, I've always been very happy with it. And you can get different uh, clamps, uh, teeth and stuff, so uh, if you're going to get a Tormach, <clears throat> I would say, you know, I would recommend this system for doing the type of work that I do. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's all I have to say about that. Um, okay, so the so the the work is touched off in the axes. Uh, the the depth is uh, thirty one thousandths, and the depth between the top here and the face of these jaws is fifty thousandths. So the cutter should just about clear. There should be twenty thousandths of clearance between the cutter and the face of these talon grips. So hopefully there's no. Hopefully I don't machine my jaw. Uh, my jaws here. <laughs> uh, it wouldn't be the first time that I've done that, but um, but thankfully this modular system is you can just replace the pieces. You know, it's great. So uh, anyway, so I'm gonna I'm gonna post out the code and then we'll get the first tool loaded up and see what it looks like. All right, cheers. So anyway, I've got the three tools here that I'm gonna be using. This is a um, a, a 16th inch um, a corner radius end mill, and the quarter radius is just five thousandths or something. It's just enough to keep that that sharp edge of the end mill from breaking off. Um, it's very helpful to use corner radius end mills, especially on brass. Uh, this is a 32nd inch end mill, the one that I'm hoping survives the operation. 
And uh, and then we've got our um, chamfer mill that I'm also hoping survives the operation. Uh, and the leadedness of the using leaded brass really contributes to that. And also um, just having you know going real light on the feeds and speeds. So 5625 dust. You're gonna load that G code. And hopefully there's no error, and there is always. Program exceeds 100,000 motion lines. Okay, I don't care about it exceeding 100,000 motion lines. It's a big program. But you know what, I think that uh, it can handle it. So we're gonna go ahead and, uh, I'm gonna put this tool in right there. And, uh, and we're just gonna make sure there's coolant in the sump. Enough, yeah, um, that looks pretty good. Maybe add a little bit of water and point this right at the thing just to make sure that's good to go. Let's see where that goes. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Right on the tip there. And um, just go ahead and press play and see what happens. It's like start. Uh, it's like start. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I think that sounds like a good feed and speed, so we're just gonna not get soaked with coolant and um, just let that go ahead. So we'll come back once that's done running and we'll put in the second tool, all right? All right, so here we have it after the first op and um, it's just roughed out that material and uh, the cutter has survived, which is <laughs> always, uh, always a good sign. Now we'll see if this one survives. Um, it should, I don't know, we'll just see what happens. Um, I'm just gonna switch out for the 30 second inch end mill, and uh, we'll just let it rip. Um, make sure the coolant looks good. Yeah, it's shooting right on the tip there, so... Uh, I think we can go ahead and start the next... Uh, the next operation here. Let's just press play. All right, so that's just gonna run out. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully it does its job. So we'll catch back up with it after after it's done running running as part of the program. All right. All right, so here we go. After the um, the teeny end mill, the thirty second end mill, thirty second inch end mill, um, and that looks really good. The cutter made it all the way through, and um, it looks exactly like what it's supposed to look like. So I'm just gonna put in the final tool here. Um, you can see it's this, uh, this chamfer mill. And these aren't really designed for cutting on the tip exactly, so hopefully there won't be too much cutting on the tip because it might break that tip off. Um, but we'll just have to see what happens. All right, so just plop that in there and then uh, just let it go. Yeah, looks good. And then we'll just go ahead and hit cycle start. And, uh, yep, looks good. Just run that through. All right. All right, so let's take a look here. Um, spray this plate off. Uh, yeah, it's hard to tell kind of from here. Let's take the tool out and um, take a look at it. Oh, dang! <laughs> Whoop. Okay, I think it's okay. Looks like uh, I didn't break it dropping it. And it looks like it survived the machining operation. So the reason I check is because if it didn't survive, then it's likely that parts of the uh, design didn't quite get um, get machined in. But if it's if it made it through the whole tool path, then it looks good that uh, that we probably have a good design cut into the plate here. So let's take this out. And usually it curls up a little bit, unfortunately. That's like loose. Did I not even tighten that down? I don't know. Hmm. Fascinating. Well, it seems to have made it through just fine regardless, huh? So let's take a look um, under magnification. Bring this over. Well, it looks okay. I might have to sand it flat a bit to get the... Mm, to get the um, the full profile the the full profile 
to come clean because it looks like these were a little overcut. But it'll still it'll still probably be okay. Let's just sand that down. Um here. Put it with some like maybe four hundred grit paper. Is it still flat? Or did that no, it bent up a little bit. So let's try to flatten it first and then worry about um Oh, yeah. There's always a lot of fiddling around, but you can see that's that's bowed pretty badly. Um, so, but that that's typical, I think. And then I usually correct that um, uh, with yeah. I can take this off of here, put that across there, and then get let's see. There we go. Just try to. Press that back into the place. Yeah. All right. Oh, it went a little too far. And now I have to kind of bend it back the other direction. Let's see. Okay. Here. Okay. Hmm, what was that? flat. Wow. Yeah, flatter than it was, to be sure. And there's a little, a couple of little humps in it, but I think overall it's pretty good. I'm not trying to get it perfectly flat. I'm just trying to get the humps out so that then I can sand it flat. Sand this up just until the face of that the cross comes into its um, fullness here. You can also sand it on the back and then see the high spots. So there's two humps here and here. Um, so I'm going to sand that until I try to get those humps almost almost polished away. and then the flat surface gets bigger and bigger, so we're almost there. And it doesn't have to be perfect, so, you know, maybe I'll just go until there's like 75% of the surface is, is on that one plane. Yeah, like something like that is pretty decent, I think. Yeah, like that's pretty good. It doesn't need to be perfectly flat. There's a low spot. Couple of little low spots, but for the most part, it's pretty good. Now let's look at um, let's look at this under magnification to see what it looks like. Just to see. Oh, good. So you can see what I'm talking about, like um, these little webs here on the crosses are um, a little thin, um, and the more I sand it, the thicker those webs will get. So I'm just going to sand it a little bit farther and see if we can get those webs. Um, to uh, to come in a little bit thicker. And then, yeah, see on the end here, they are already kind of as thick as I would like them to be. So just kind of that center section needs to be sanded a little bit more. So let's go sand a little bit further. It's not, you don't like to see that. I'm trying to put my force right on the center there because that's where I really want it to be. 
come in. And those are still looking a little thin, so let's just keep going. Maybe I need a rougher grit sandpaper. Oh, those are looking pretty good. Yeah, so you can see that these crosses are really starting to, to flesh themselves, to get fleshed out now. Um, but I don't want to go, yeah, see on the edge here, they're getting too thick. So I'm kind of nervous about, I think that this will be a happy medium where the ones on the edge are a little thick and the ones in the center are a little thin, but I'm going to stop right here. So, okay. so the last piece of the puzzle is, uh, oh yeah, look at how thick those got on the ends. And then they get thin in the middle, and they got thick. Well, we'll just go ahead and print up a, a paper, and uh, yeah, we'll just see what it looks like. Maybe it'll be a cool effect, having it get thinner in the middle and then thicker on the edges. Like, maybe that'll look cool. Or maybe it doesn't really matter. Maybe it'll look cool regardless. So, um, The way I mount it in the hot foil stamping machine is with a dovetail slot. So I run a dovetail cutter along the spine on the back um, and cut this so that it fits on the uh, fixture. And this dovetail mounting design was just something that I came up with, you know, just with the tools that I happen to have on hand and just works for me. So I, I mill a dovetail slot down the back and then I can mount that in the machine and press it and make a, yeah. So let's go ahead and do that. All right. Great. So here I've got the uh, the stamping plate with the uh, dovetail groove um, machined in the back, and it fits into. Hmm. Let's see here. I should just take this whole thing out. So this is my hot foil stamping machine. It's a Kingsley uh, hot stamp machine from the 1930s, and it's a lovely little machine that I got off of eBay. And then I made all these little adapter plates and stuff for it um, uh, in order to kind of make it work uh, with my own with my own stuff instead of having to use their stuff. Basically, I wanted to be able to use my own plates, and so I made this block, this steel block here. Oh my gosh, why is that? glued in place. Anyway, so I made this steel block that's got um, a male dovetail, um, uh, what would you call that? I guess a um, wedge, some sort of this guide rail here that's got a dovetail. Um, it's almost imperceptible, but it does have a dovetail cut into it. And I used the same dovetail cutter to cut this as I used to cut all the plates. And so this just slides right on there, just like that. And then um, I can use that either to just to, to print print directly like that, or sometimes I made I made this um this sort of a extension adapter block, so sometimes I have to use that instead. Um, but we'll just go ahead and use this and see what it looks like. Um, yep. Yeah, so you just push that in there, ah, just like that. And this was the original plate holder that came with the machine, and so I had just adapted that block to the to the original holder. Um, uh, 
There we go. And slide that in there, just like that. And clip it into place. Good. So let's just warm that up. And um, let's see. I make this thing, I stick it on here like this. And I've got this little plate here. And it's just a sheet of paper or this cardboard stuff that the machines come with. There are these cushion boards. This is like original Kingsley cushion board, but you need you basically need something to press the material into because if you just press against the flat uh, printing platen here, it won't do a good job. Um, so you need something soft. And then I put the plate uh, directly up against this fence and the back of the stop there. Um, just so that I'm able to locate the uh, the paper. So all I have to do is get that plate located against this fence and this backstop. I don't know if you can see that, but it's basically yeah squared away, and then tighten that up. And then if I put the paper right against that back there, it'll exactly locate that um, that to print right in the center of the paper. So. Now all we have to do is cut out a bellows paper itself, or maybe I can find one that's already that size. Yeah, so this is that same size. Boop. Or... Um, yeah, that one's that same size too. So let's just print a couple different colors here. And this is uh, Lakta paper. It's Nepalese, and it's really lovely paper. And this is mulberry paper uh, that I got from a local art store here in Denver. And, yep, yeah, we'll just print on those and see what they look like and uh, just as soon as that machine gets warmed up so all right so I I cut out some black ones as well um, the plate is heated up and we're ready to try to make a test print here so I punched these out um, with a steel rule die um, into that perfect shape and so since the that face is located and that face is located um, against those fences, then I stand a reasonable chance, a very reasonable chance, of actually getting that stamp right smack dab in the center of that um, bellows paper. And so that's what that looks like. Now you can see um, they're obviously thicker on the outside and they get really thin here on the inside. Um, but I don't know if that's something I'm going to try to fix. I think that that is a really, looks really nice. I think that that's a really handsome bellows paper. I think that looks really good. Um, please, you know, if you think that that looks like garbage and that I should make it so that it's perfect everywhere and each one is identical and it's absolutely crisp and clean, and if you think I'm not being a perfectionist enough, uh, please, um, you know, comment in the comment section, let me know, because sometimes I have a hard time knowing exactly how perfect I should try to make things. Um, and you always have to balance the desire for the ideal of perfection against the necessity of, you know, actually getting an instrument built like this decade, you know. Um, and so I think you have to kind of figure out how to navigate that yourself. But I think for me, this printing plate was a success, and I think it looks really nice, and I think it'll look really good on the bellows. Um, this is that mulberry. It's like a dark purple and gold. Um, and I can print this on any color. So let's look at, like, like black on cream. So if we do one like this and then hot foil stamp in the black color, that might look very nice as well. Let's take a look here. And you can get this hot foil stamp stuff in pretty much any color you can imagine. Um, there we go. <clears throat> oh yeah, that looks very good. I really like that. 
the black on brown. It looks very, very handsome indeed. So, you know, if, um, if you're watching this video and, uh, just turn this off while I'm trying to talk here. Uh, if you're watching this video and you have put it in an order for an instrument from me, um, you know, this is kind of an idea of the sorts of different stuff I can do with bellows papers, um, or have done in the past, you know, making different, uh, different plates and different colored paper and different colored stampings and stuff. Um, but I am partial to this black and gold. I think it's very traditional looking and very handsome looking. Um, so, yep. So there you go. That's my quick little video on how I make the, uh, the bellows paper printing plates. Um, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching. Cheers.